And we are live. Thank you for your patience, um, everybody in the Zoom room. Welcome. Uh, welcome also to people who are watching us from the live stream. My name is Chantal Bilodeau. I am one of the co-curators of the Green Rooms, um, and I'm really happy you're joining us. Um, it's the end of a really full day of conversation, so we're um, all our heads are full for those of us who were with us with, for some of the previous conversations, but we're really looking forward to this one. Um, this is the uh, second day of the green rooms. We have we started yesterday. Today we have one more session tomorrow, and actually a dance party later tonight. Uh, the green rooms are produced by English Theater at the National uh, Arts Center and presented by Folda in collaboration with the Canada Council for the Arts the City of Kingston, the National Theatre School, and HowlRound Theatre Commons. And before we start, I would like to acknowledge that um, the Green Rooms are, the mission control for the Green Rooms um, are located in, is located in Kingston, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and the huron Wendat. Kingston is covered by Treaty 57, and the territory was acquired in 1783 in Crawford's purchases. And now I'm so um, happy to introduce you to uh, MC playwright and agitator Donna Michelle St. Bernard and playwright and director Jordan Tannehill, who are here to talk about the future. Um, during the conversation, please feel free to use the chat to comment uh, along the way, and there will be a formal Q&A uh, section at the end of this conversation. So I'm turning it to you, Donna, Michelle, and uh, Jordan. Awesome. Thank you, Chantal. Thanks, people in the real world and people in the virtual world. Um, we, uh, we were given this uh, deliciously broad question about what is the future and so uh, with 10 minutes I have 10 very random reflections on that. Uh, the future is now a place that is so strange that I can actually say please clap and I don't even feel a little bit like Jeb Bush. High five me if you get that joke, just drop a five in the chat if you get that joke because I still need feedback you know as a performer. Okay cool. The future is now because the future is how we choose to evolve in this moment in order to meet the coming moment with strength instead of waiting for it to happen, waiting for change to happen, and hopefully we can catch up. And I think in this moment, we can all see um, that in a lot of ways, catching up is not a really good look. Idea two. Um, when things started to change drastically in everyone's lives at the same time, um, the biggest question was, how can we gather? And then we came up with all this stuff. Um, the question at the, at the center of how can we gather really is, how can I be where I'm not? And I think the future is evolving that question now that we found the tools to be in places that we're not. Uh, evolving the question into how can I pr presence others now who I could not presence before? How can uh, I see more of what I've been oblivious to or what I've had excellent reasons not to see. Um, yeah, that's probably enough about that. Whoever knows. Um, my third thought about this. Um, for most of my life, I have randomly said inappropriately at meetings and at any given time, where are my rocket boots? By which I mean, why isn't the future here yet? And I've always actually wanted rocket boots, even though that's reckless and I can't be trusted with them. I can't even drive a car. But then this year on Twitter, I heard the word space bra and I may never say rocket boots again. What's a space bra? When can I have one? I'm, I'm thinking about the ways that we can expand what we're able to imagine and what we aspire to. And as a result, what we are crafting. Um, ways that we are creating the things that we imagined when we thought we were just kidding, space bra. Creating things that we imagined when we thought we were just kidding or fantasizing is how we got smart homes, which are a trap and a very bad idea. But we can now imagine better things that will be actualized because we imagined them. Someone had to say robot before there was a robot. So somebody out there, say robot and make me a space bra. I'd, I'd be ever so grateful. Thank you. 
um, I'm very into sci-fi. And um, the next thing I thought about was some sci-fi books that I've been reading, some contemporary Canadian sci-fi. Probably the first um, one in this particular thread I'm thinking of is The Marrow Thieves by Sherry Dimaline. Um, there's a there's an aspect of the premise of the the world build in that book that essentially says that there will come a, a circumstance in which those of us who have considered ex been considered extraneous will become needed in some way and then instead of being valued because we are needed that need will become a danger to us so we will be hunted for the thing that is needed and um science fiction is so prescient and I think that the fact that that kind of idea has come up more than once in contemporary fiction makes me want to think about not only how this moment we're in could emulate that pattern but also how we can be purposeful about the ways that this moment could not emulate that pattern. So for example um, now that we're relying more on technology in different ways we can choose not to vulture the innovations of the disabled community while perpetuating their exclusion in the spaces where we use their tools or um, using and learning from organizing strategies of black activists in spaces where black people are not safe, welcome or comfortable or um, implementing or even just alluding to and talking about structures of indigenous justice while having no relationships with indigenous communities. Those are things we don't have to do. Those are things we can choose to do better um, so that we are not takers. Um, Next idea. The future is me. I am so definitely the future that right now Russell Wilson, Russell Wilson is raising my son and he's doing a really good job. Can you just high five me if you get that joke? Just drop me a five in the chat. I just, I'm just curious who's out there. Wow, shocking. Blow me down. Hi guys. I see you too. Uh, the future is um, finding out what we never needed, what we gave up, what we don't need to get back, what we still don't need but haven't noticed yet. Um, I really thought I needed lattes and I'd still take one, uh, but I'm managing. And so what are the things that I thought I needed that came at someone's expense that cost too much environmentally that I overlooked for my convenience. And now that I've learned that I don't need them, how can I not be so quick to go back? And how can I expand that into bigger thinking? So how can I move beyond um, my reusable cup into my um, not massive and disposable set? And then how do we go beyond that? Uh, the first time we were touring Keith Barker's play, The Hours That Remain, to uh, the Yukon and we were planning all this freight and all the stuff that was in the set was made of that we had to buy and move to the next place where the show was and then somebody actually just asked me why would you fly gravel across the country do they have gravel there legit never occurred to me and I know that what I'm telling you is that I'm a fool but that is also a part of this story I'm a fool a and so are you so you know Maybe just like, how can I be a little bit less fool tomorrow? How can I be real about why I'm doing things and what the real cost of those things is um, and visibilize those things to myself? <sighs> okay, I'm running out of ideas. Just kidding, I'll never will. Um, then I thought about the way that new tools are being standardized. Zoom is one of them. I'm still baffled, but I'm here. I showed up. Uh, and familiar tools are being phased out. All the games I play are uh, run on Shockwave and apparently Shockwave's over. Um, maybe we can start a separate conversation in a safe space about how much that hurts me, but people are still gaming. So, okay, that's cool. Um, when everything changed in a way that wasn't natural to me, I had no choice but to adapt and to learn. And um, I'm turning that the question to myself about what do I now have to offer other people who still haven't overcome the barriers to access? What do I have to, to teach or to share that is newly or differently needed? Not that I have this giant wealth of new knowledge that I'm gonna, um, that anyone's gonna come to me first for any, any kind of technological questions, but 
what are the ways that the tools um, that I already had fit differently into the shape of what is currently needed? Because you're always needed, we are always needed. And um, sometimes it's up, up to us to find the need that shapes what we have to offer. So I want to keep my eye on the landscape as that changes, as what is needed changes, um, be attentive to changing what it is that I offer and what my role is um, in the conversation, in the action. Um, yeah. One day it won't be my role to make a lot of noise. What a quiet day that will be. Um, and then I thought that contemplating the future, as I do like to do, can be an act of escapism, but it can also be an act of map making. Um, and that it's not possible to draw a line from point A to point B before you name point B. So um, I do think a lot of what people call lip service, um, probably accurately, we could also reframe as naming point B and we could ask the people who are naming it to start drawing the line. That's a thing. Thought number nine, aesthetic survival. Uh, is it possible to engage with what I'm calling instruments of perfecting, the things that make it possible to um, shape our reality in I guess what I consider a more intrusive way? Is it possible to engage with these instruments and all the ways that we can control the way that we present in a digital world without investing value in perfection. Um, is it possible for me to stream live on Zoom without lipstick? So far, no, but the future will tell us what, what it holds. I continue to grow as a person, I swear. You can't see it, it's slow. Idea 10, the future is unknown. And I wonder how I can stay fluid without ever being watered down. How I can be responsive to change, but not blown about by whatever's taking place. Um, and I was talking with some playwrights at Nightwoods right from the hip um, unit earlier today about reflecting in this moment on the things that used to be important that still are and what an, what an anchor that can be and to believe and to understand the ways in which those things will continue to be important in the future and how we prepare to bring them into the future in a good and a strong way. Oh, damn, I did so good on time today, y'all. That's my piece. Over to you, Jordan. Amazing, thank you much. That, damn, that's awesome. And I think I speak for everyone to say that. I could have listened to like 10 or 20 more. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in. It's a huge pleasure and honor to be sharing this space with DM. May have lost Jordan. Um, so uh, it gives me huge pleasure to say hello, everybody, while we uh, work to get Jordan back. He's a uh, uh, maybe it's the transatlantic crossing in the middle of the night, or maybe it's because he was serious with respect to wanting to spend a bit more time in your thoughts, um, which I would heartily agree with. Um, Jordan, are you back? Until Jordan's back, um, I'm wondering, uh, Donna Michelle, if you would be cool with engaging with some questions. I'm the coolest. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so I guess my first question is why, what will be good about going live without lipstick? What will be good? Yeah. Oh, I mean, politically, I guess it would signal that I'm not vain and that I'm not um, preoccupied with my image. But by telling you that I'm letting you know that it's the image of not being preoccupied with my image that's of value to me but um, also because God made me perfect and y'all should get to see that. Welcome back, Jordan. Thank you. I wasn't being obnoxious. I was <laughs> seeing back. like humble and intelligent. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out. Sorry guys, that's, that's some UK Wi-Fi for you. Um, uh, so I'm here, in, I'm here in London at the moment. Um, it's, it's late, it's 2 a.m. Um, and I'm gonna be talking to you guys about um, 
Extinction Rebellion. And uh, obviously Extinction Rebellion has been happening uh, around the world uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's an international movement around climate. But I'm going to be speak speaking specifically around uh, the Spring Rebellion that occurred last year in London and some of the reflections and thoughts that I took away from that um, as I was sort of implicated um, in various ways in that. Just for a little background, um, the, the rebellion happened over about 10 days in London and um, the city essentially uh, was divided into four quadrants that different activists were responsible for. So activists living in South London, um, uh, South London, North London, East London and West London. And they were each tasked with claiming or taking over essentially a different site, a public site in the city of London. So South Londoners took over uh, Waterloo Bridge and they erected a barricade there and basically shut down the bridge and used it as a protest site for the duration of the protest. North London uh, protesters claimed uh, Oxford Circus, uh, which is, for those of you who know, London is a very busy intersection. It's a little bit, it's kind of a little bit like Bloor and Young. They, they uh, shut that down. Uh, those of uh, those of the uh, those activists in the West London took over Parliament Square, which is right outside of uh, Parliament, uh, Big Ben, and um, uh, oh sorry, that was, that was actually East London, and then West London took over Marble Arch, which is a, a site in uh, in um, Hyde Park. And what I'm talking about from a theater context, which I found particularly illuminating, I guess, about Extinction Rebellion was. Um, the ways in which theatrics and the, the staging of visuals um, was a key part of what kept the rebellion in the public eye throughout the 10 days of, of its duration. Um, the ways in which performative acts or performative gestures were, cr were critical to the success uh, of the rebellion. And so some of those performance gestures, I mean, include people, uh, literally activists gluing their hands to the pavement outside of Shell Oil Corporation headquarters or gluing themselves to um, public transit, um, you know, uh, to, to metro cars, uh, like tube cars, um, to buses. Um, the, um, the theatrics of um, claiming sites of, of uh, iconic sites in the city. So a bridge, you know, shutting down a bridge and, and, and deploying, um, you know, banners off the sides, you know, the, the sort of the, the um, theatrics of space. And also uh, a use of props. And so like the, one of the iconic images from the rebellion was this huge pink boat that was deployed in the middle of So uh, Talia, I was, I was speaking to a German friend about this and she said, it's so in in interesting in the English language, we say staging protest, the idea of staging a protest. And that for the first time, um, I really, it really resonated with me, the idea of what it is to stage protest and, and, and to consider the theatrical imagery around um, and the tools that we bring as artists or as, as makers of performance or live events to um, to bear on these uh, on these activist conditions, and I think what's become so critical in uh, what was what was seen as so critical, I think, during Extinction Rebellion was how do you create images that uh, and, and incidents that can be captured on video uh, and retweeted, you know, 10, 20, 40,000 times. Um, how can you create images that uh, imprint themselves in the minds of a public um, and become uh, you know, viral. Um, what was uh, interesting to me was as well uh, in, in I, I, so I was implicated in the rebellion. I was, I was on the bridge, on, on the water of the bridge, um, helping to hold that site. Um, I was um, uh, eventually arrested and um, was in solitary confinement for 14 hours and uh, charged and later released. Um, but the, um, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said for, um, you know, who, who was able to put their bodies on the line to be arrested. Um, and um, also the, even the theatrics of those arrests at the time, um, the theatrics of people who, um, you know, uh, bodies who are not usually in, 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 um, in, the line of, of police engagement, you know, bodies that are not um, 
usually arrested and um, the, the politics of that and, um, you know, who, um, what is it to, to, to see, um, you know, uh, a, a white grandmother being carried away by all fours, by, by cops? How is that different in the public imagination somehow than, than who we might otherwise imagine being arrested in these scenarios? I think like the, the, the confrontation, the relationship between the police and the, and the protesters, there's so much to unpack there. And, um, um, and you know, my, of course, my experience of arrest and, and, you know, detainment being something altogether different than a lot of other people's experience of that, probably in different times and different scenarios with the police force. Um, but nevertheless, the sort of the ways in which um, Extinction Rebellion, um, in order to um, maintain a kind of fidelity of record, filmed and documented every single arrest that occurred so that, the, you know, the police, of course, are, are filming there from their end, but activists are also filming their own arrests um, and, and, and the ways in which they are also creating a kind of archive experience of experience should should legal proceedings happen and there was there was um uh you know around the same time i i mean this is sort of tangential a little bit to um the the conversation around climate but that same that same month in in april i um was engaged in a in a, in a direct action a protest action at the dorchester hotel protesting um, the ratification of Sharia law in Brunei, which would have seen the stony deaths of, of homosexuals and adulterers and um, um, a number of other uh, categories of, uh, of, of sexual cr crimes in Brunei. And the Brunei Investment Agency owns and operates the Dorchester Collection of Hotels, which are a luxury brand of hotels um, across the world. And um, uh, three friends of mine and I um, engaged in a protest action at, at the hotel um, during uh, high tea um, in which we um, deployed signs and, and um, uh, used, used a megaphone to sort of draw attention to the boycott that was ongoing um, with the hotel chain. Um, and it was... Um, once again, for me, a sort of, um, I should say that the video of that incident, um, we later posted on social media and, and it went viral and, and um, was part of the kind of ongoing efforts to, um, to draw attention to, to the incident and, and pressure on the Dorchester Hotel collection, which was ultimately successful in that the, the Sultan of Brunei did ultimately back down from the passing of, of, the, of the legislation. Um, but it made me think a lot about, about the ways in which um, a background again in, in theater and in staging events um, was critical to, to how that worked. Um, the ways in which we we sort of planned and rehearsed essentially everything we were going to do and say, and the ways in which everything from what we wore to to our text to the staging, like what what room we chose in the hotel, and the fact that you know the fact that the the, the protest itself would have I think um, been far less effective or certainly far less viral or impactful to watch had um, the security guards of the hotel uh, and the personal security guards of the various wealthy people who were working there, had they not cast themselves essentially as the antagonists in this encounter, they basically, they basically descended upon us, grabbed us and began to sort of frog march us out of the hotel with incredible force and, and sort of, you know, sort of try to push us through these, um, uh, you know, revolving doors of the hotel had they not kind of cast themselves as the roles of the antagonist, had we been just able to kind of deploy our, you know, say our bit and then walk out peacefully, you know, we may have had a few thousand views and some, you know, we may have kind of had some traction within the community, activist community, but it would not have gone sort of mega viral the way it did. And I think so much of that comes down to the basic theatrics of the event and that suddenly you have people who are, you have the sort of, um, this is no longer a kind of, um, a kind of abstract conflict that's occurring sort of, you know, in another part of the world. And, and, and there's, there's not this kind of disconnect between what we're doing in the hotel versus what's happening over there. There's this kind of embodiment of a luxury brand shutting down and silencing queer voices. It becomes a physical action that occurs and that we can watch. And so it sort of made me think quite a bit about what are the conditions again, that create a viral encounter or that create pro that magnify protest. Um, and just kind of getting back to sort of wrap up to, to I found the images that were for me the most, um, yeah, just the sort of the most um, 
stunning or or or, or sort of um, mo moving, I guess, um, of Extinction Rebellion were um, again these 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 individual performative acts of of resistance, and particularly the the um, the incidents of um, uh, you know citizens, everyday citizens. In, in one case, there was an 85 year old man who who glued himself to the top of a uh, of a train car in London. Um, and the ways in which, um, for me, I, I could kind of read these 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 um, these gestures as as like acts of performance art as much as I could as much as they were kind of acts of protest. Um, for me, felt like they were aesthetic gestures. Um, they were emotive gestures and narrative gestures as much as they were kind of these political gestures. Um, so I guess in terms of how this replies to the future, um, I mean, this is, and this is of course, just specifically speaking about environmental activism in this case, um, the activism around Extinction Rebellion in London. I mean, thinking about the tools, I mean, even though our form, uh, you know, our theater feels a little bit like it's in a coma at the moment, the fact that we're sort of, you know, just hungering to be back in, in spaces together publicly. I mean, I, I have been, in, of course, involved in Black Lives Matter protests here in London in the past few days. So in that sense, I've been back amongst people, but not in a performance context or in a theatrical context. And I, and I think um, until we are, you know, thinking critically, how can we use our, how can we use these skill sets that we have? We have tools, we have uh, these, um, you know, immense um, skill sets about knowing how to stage events, knowing how to kind of create images, striking images, knowing how to kind of communicate layered, Sociopolitical, you know, like uh, layers of sociopolitical import through through an image or through a gesture or through you know through a performative act, um, and so knowing how to deploy those and, and knowing how to kind of create a kind of um, whether it's through direct action or whether it's through kind of um, uh, some other means, I think that's um, and, and and also how we can how we can use the tools, I guess, of the internet and online to kind of magnify those gestures as well. So those are things I've been thinking about, and um, it's sort of as much about the present as it is the future. But um, I guess, yeah, it's it's one of the things I've been thinking about really in the last year or so is really how can I use those tools of, as being a theater artist to kind of for radical action, essentially. So yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, um, both of you, for uh, taking the stage for. Uh, a period of time to talk about uh, how you're seeing the future and now from each of your perspectives and uh, with relation to a number of um, avenues that kind of um, <laughs> bring together this, this point now, looking ahead to the future. I have a couple of questions just to kick off and then I would like to ask if anyone does have any questions to put them into the chat um, or, uh, yeah, put them into the chat or uh, you can also um, put your hand up um, if you go to the participants button, and um, I think you can put your hand up that way. However you'd like to do it, please uh, please do. Um, so I'd like to start just by asking um, you, Donna Michelle, first of all, thank you so much for answering that question that I asked when we lost Jordan, because, uh, you know, it was it was fun and it was off the cuff, but it was it ended up being a, um, uh, a really um, made me think uh, the answer. So thank you so much for really engaging with it. And um, I, I just want to ask about, um, you referred to the Marrow Thieves, um, Cheryl Demoline's book, and you said that hunted for, um, hunted for the thing that is needed. And I'm curious um, about what that means for you, for you now as an, as an artist and as you project to the future. I mean, Boy, wow. In this, in this moment, at this time on this day today, I guess it means um, how do I write an anti-racist statement or clean up this mess I made? And it doesn't mean, can we look at your script and consider producing it? You know, it means an ongoing pattern of being sucked dry for what, uh, what other people need. And the, uh, failure to ask the reciprocal question about what's needed in return. Thank you. And I feel, uh, I feel embarrassed for not understanding sort of the depth of, of what that offer was. And so I really appreciate you 
um, answering that uh, question. Uh, thanks. Um, you, you also um, you also said that the future is me, and um, and then made a joke that I didn't get, so I didn't get to do the high five. Um, so I, I feel like the future is you, um, but I but I I and I don't see that as as humorous. Um, I see that as uh, yes. So I guess I'm just wondering if if I'm if I miss something in that, or is it just saying like I'm here and this is the future is what I'm what I'm placing myself into the future with. Oh, you've given it so much more credit. It was a joke about a rapper and a football player. You don't need to look any further into it. Okay. All right. It's funny. But I, appreciate, because... I appreciate you thinking that things I say have meaning. Well, they do. So, some, some people got it. We, we got some fives. I know some people. Got <laughs> okay. Then I've got one more. Um, and, and maybe this was humor, but it really struck me um, quite deeply. And that is, um, uh, you said that you want to be fluid without being watered down. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that really struck a chord because it's it's so hard to know how to be in these constantly shifting times and moments and to be available to what is uh, coming at us, but as, as you say, to not be watered down. And I wonder if you have uh, particular things that you gravitate towards in order to help keep that balance in your life? Um, yeah, I guess, um, your questions are very hard tonight. Um, I look to my collaborators and the people who I trust to check me in my community in the ways that I'm moving differently. So um, a, a rock in a hard place seems to be um, everything has to go digital now versus theater isn't digital and the validity of that entire spectrum and how those things can be correct in different moments. And so like, I don't want to rush to do digital stuff because Canada Council told me to. I don't work for them. But on the other hand, there's some things I want to do that are, that are digital. I'm like, oh, can I do that without being a sucker? I went all the way through high school not playing basketball because people kept asking me if I did. That's you know, so, so what's the balance of serving what my, what my need is that, that stems from something before this exact moment? Um, yeah. How does this come from me? That's, I guess, my centering question. How does the impulse to do this new work come from me as opposed to there's a platform being offered or some other objective? Thank you. Um, Jordan, you, uh, you know, we're, we're deeply involved in, as you said, in extension, in extinction rebellion. And, um, and also, um, uh, I don't know what the name of the action was at the Dorchester hotel. And also you, uh, <coughs> you were in, involved in a performance, um, in, um, um, I'm, I can't remember the name of the, it, which country was it Hungary. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, that's uh, true. I did a, a number of direct actions in Hungary around, um, uh, well, specifically the, the Orban government's um, uh, number of things. I mean, they, they, um, the, the, the banning of, of the study of transgendered issues in post-secondary education and subsequent to that now the elimination of gender identity at, at all um, from any kind of legal recognition. Uh, so I read the entirety of Judith Butler's gender trouble outside the uh, Hungarian parliament over eight hours. Um, in November of, of, I guess, 2019. Um, so it's just sort of the various, yeah, the, try, trying to find ways to kind of uh, make theater performance actionable, I suppose. Well, well and, I, and I think, you know, part of why I was so excited for the two of you to be um, in the same Zoom room together anyway, was that both of you in your work have, you know, uh, Donna Michelle with 50, 54ology and sort of taking uh, this massive look at so many different stories representative of different um, issues and questions and uh, horror stories in certain places and bringing it under sort of a, a, a huge investigation of um, of people and um, and loves and losses and extractions and issues and and Jordan in terms of your um, using the word um, words uh, sort of deploying theat theatricality and I'm just thinking you know I, I I 
it feels to me like the way in which um, y- you're you're conscious about your uh, your protests as uh, as acts of theater in some respects, and I guess I wonder about how you. Uh, there's no question that what you do inspires and is uh, and is is terrifying, but I wonder how you sit with what you're able to do. I have a question around what your capacity as a young white man who can um, walk into the, the Dorchester to, to stage that and, and somebody else who might not be able to and how you, because I know you do have some, some thoughts about that. For sure. And I, and I would love to yeah. hear your thoughts about that, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely sort of, um, yeah, to acknowledge the privilege that is bestowed upon my body in person and to leverage that for for. To, to use that as a, as a tool or as a weapon to, for, against those who are oppressing my friends and loved ones and co- colleagues and peers and, and people like myself. And, and I think, um, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which, um, um, yes, like the, the fact that we could kind of um, play a kind of like Mayfair drag um, and like these guys, you know, we could show up in suits and, and, and be, seated at the Dorchester Hotel, not that we wouldn't be seated if we were white, but we, but th- there's something about, I think, the fact that we kind of blend in more to the scenery that kind of like innate, something about that does something to the psychology of watching that video, I think, than if we were even, even if we were sort of just like, you know, like, n- nor- like wearing our kind of normal street punk looks, like even if, even if we were just, you know, kind of our, like in our kind of normal queer rave look, and we were in that space, and if we weren't wearing suits, we weren't kind of, um, if we weren't kind of coded as being of that kind of sociopolitical milieu, it, it would have, that protest would have resonated differently. We may not have gotten seated even like, you know, there, there's ways in which all these kind of layers of access and privilege and, and enable certain, I guess, capacities for protest. I mean, same thing with Extinction Rebellion as well. I think one of my, one of my critiques of Extinction is, you know, it was, it was diverse to an extent, but it was still largely, I think, quite white. Um, and quite middle class, um, and there, you know, there it was intersectional in in different ways, but not not to the extent that it could be or should be. Um, and um, but there's other kinds of, I guess, things like layers of precarity. I think whenever I'm doing political actions here in in a, in whether it's in Hungary or whether it's in the UK, I mean, I'm not a citizen of these countries, and so I'm I am nervous about arrest and and um, and deportation and you know I, my, my legal status like I, I you know was very encouraged I was very encouraged not to be arrested for instance in Extinction Rebellion because I could be denied the ability to live here and work here um, which is you know not of course a, a risk to my bodily harm you know it's not bodily harm it's not my life of course the stakes are lower but um, there's there's ways in which I'm you know I, I'm also trying to kind of measure the, the amount of risk that I'm able to take based on the precarity of my situation in different ways. And um, there was a protest I was going to stage actually at the um, War Museum against the, um, the the paintings of George W. Bush that were exhibited there in September. Uh, well, actually they were exhibited throughout the summer in, uh, until the fall last year at the War Museum. Um, uh, his paintings of, of uh, Iraq war veterans and for, sort of various reasons, political reasons and, and sort of um, visa reasons, I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I didn't do it. Um, so there's ways in which sometimes I sort of will plan something and kind of psych myself out or, 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 or back myself down from something. And I think we all um, must make those kind of risk assessments, I guess. So, and I definitely acknowledge that I've, I've, I've had, you know, a privilege, even the privilege of being an artist who is not employed by a, by an employer? You know, I can I, I I'm an artist who makes enough money that I can live through my art, and I don't have to worry about being fired for my job for these things as well. There's all kinds of ways in which you know some people are more better situated in a way, or or have more security to be able to take those kinds of political risks. Um, thank you. I was hoping that um, maybe uh, Don and Michelle might have a question for you, and you might be able to talk without me. Um... Uh, getting in and then there's a couple of questions uh, from the floor if we have time before we're done. Yeah. Oh, Donna Michelle, I think you're muted. Thank you so much. <laughs> Enforcing how bad I am at this. 
Um, I have a, um, an observation that I want to share with you, Jordan, hmm. um, beca because I have a feeling in my body. And hmm. then I, I need to just talk about it for a second. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting with some of the stuff that you're saying, and I hear how it's true and logical. Um, but I, I um, keep on hearing the way that the public imagination receives differently a white grandma being dragged away. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to express to you with love and without ascribing anything to your intention that when I hear that, I hear myself being imagined out of the public. Mm. And I, I also hear that um, violence to my body is commonplace mm. and not worthy of mention or redress. I don't think that those are the things you mean, but just, um, I think a lot of well-meaning talk, people talk about the value of their white body in the struggle. And I want to make sure that you know that I'm here hearing that I have less value in my body. Mm. And without ascribing that intention to you, that is uncomfortable for me to listen to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hear that. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate um, you sharing that. I think um, uh, I, I, I raise that as a critique, I think, of, of Extinction Rebellion or I suppose of British media in its representation of these events um, and the ways in which I think the British media's um, portrayal of, of, of Extinction Rebellion and its highlighting of white bodies um, the problematics of that, the ways in which that's used or deployed for public sympathy um, in, in, in Britain. So I think, I, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying and I, I completely hear that and agree. I think that's um, the, um, and I, I think that, that has remained ongoing problematic in reporting actually around um, climate, uh, climate protests and especially as it exists here in Britain. That, that, that white bodies are accorded more um, somehow virtue by, or, or they, are, they are seen as the sort of the, the default for the public or something. Um, and I think that's the, that is, I hope that's different than Canada, but it feels like that is a huge problem and a huge kind of, um, a kind of violence in the British media in, from, from, my, from my observation. Well, thanks for hearing that. Yeah. So we are um, so close to to time, which just seems um, not not possible. Um, but there were some questions from the from the floor, and maybe I'll just read um, three, and then maybe a choice to to go for one. So one was um, from the live stream. Do you feel that this is a true moment of change? And if you do, how do you think we can keep this change permanent? That's the first. How can we give hope in our work as artists and not contribute to the eco-anxiety when we perform on that issue? Also, do you believe we should give hope or press that this issue is important? And then finally, what kind of stories and or narrative gestures do you feel can contribute to the thought shift that's needed for us to make the kind of societal change we have the potential to make at this moment in time? So three massive questions. Mm. About a minute. <laughs> could, could you repeat the first one, uh, um, Sarah? Sure. Um, the first one. Do you feel that this is a true moment of change? And if you do, how do you think we can keep this change permanent? Mm. Joanne, do you want to go ahead? I just talked Oof. a bunch. Uh, <laughs> um, if you, yeah, buddy, why don't you take a stab at that? Yeah. I mean, I like I, I feel like whether it's I mean, speaking about the climate for sure, I would say that um, from last year, especially onward, I feel like there did feel like a kind of revolutionary potential that was that was like there was there was something that there felt like a sea change that had occurred. I think especially amongst I think I think a revolution that is beginning with or is being led by young people 
I think is usually a revolution in good hands um, often. And I think the fact that there was such a huge sort of um, wellspring of, of, um, um, of grassroots activism among generations on climate starting you know, kind of last year, you know, moving a bit and, and hopefully continuing despite the sort of stalling of COVID. I think that, um, I think enough has, ha enough, enough has, has changed um, both in the consciousness of a, a sort of broad public, but also in some policy that I think that that change is permanent and I hope continues for sure. Um, I do feel like, I do sense there feels like a revolutionary moment that's continuing at this, at this moment, um, which is exciting. Um, but um, yeah, I hope, and I, I, I hope there have been permanent changes already made. Thanks, Jordan. We've, we've got like a minute, um, Donna Michelle, if you wanna. I've got 20 seconds. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think it's a moment of true change because I think every moment is a moment of true change and every moment feels like the biggest change that there ever was to the people who have to contend with the discomfort of the unsettling. And some, sometimes those people were correct and it was in fact the biggest thing ever, but they were gonna think that whether it was or not. Um, I think that whether or not this is a moment of true change, whether or not this is the biggest change there ever is, whether or not any of that, this is the only moment in which you can make change. So what, what other thing are we waiting for than now? Like this is it, it's now. Thank you both so much. Um, you are two artists that I admire greatly and uh, it's so, um, generous of you both to come and share this time with us and to try to take on a topic like the future and particularly I think in this moment there's so many questions and uh, um, thank you I can't wait to see what both of you do as we head into the future um, you both have given us uh, in Canada and abroad so many things to think about and ways to feel about things um, and I look forward to more and more from from you both so um, this is the official end of our time. I wanna thank all of you here in the Zoom call and all of you on the live stream, Donna Michelle St. Bernard and Jordan Tannehill. Thank you for this late night conversation. And I hope that um, all of you will stay and dance it out with um, DJ Cyrus Marcus Ware. And we're gonna dance like the earth is watching because the earth is. So thanks a lot. And thank you, um, thank you both. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Dan. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah.